remain standing. I heard it said one time that Jesus is all you need. And when he's all you've got, you'll realize he's all you need. Let's sing together. you may be seated. Once upon his back he knew this was the beginning of the end. With every fragile step he
God saw his son whom he loved. Take your Bibles, find the book of Isaiah, chapter number 3, and stand to your feet and take God's precious holy word with you. And let's hold our Bibles up, and as you're standing, y'all are moving slow today now, let's go. <laughs> Didn't know we needed to do calisthenics before we came. All right, here we go. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, and I will hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Stay right there, standing, Isaiah chapter number 3, verse number 1. Here's what God's holy word says. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of fifty and the honorable men, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. 
And the people shall be oppressed every one by another and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. And when a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The show of their countenance doth witness against them and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. That's the reading of God's word and everybody say it. God, melt our hearts with your holy word is our prayer. And we pray thy will be done, that you would just show up today and frankly show out and just show in a great and mighty way, Lord, that it's time that your word is uplifted in our hearts and our minds and in our souls and that you'll receive all glory and honor today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and be seated. And let me just ask a question. Are we rotting on the vine? Are we rotting on the vine. Now when we look in God's word here, this text was used last week and we looked at that for rent, for sale, and we need to really be for real. But as we look deeper at this text today and we go back to the book of Isaiah, uh, we look at the end of chapter number 2 and what we see there is some, something I think is very interesting. What we have at the end of chapter 2, uh, as we say it just pretty bluntly right here, is it just tells us and it is taking us that we should not put our confidence in anything other than the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and in Isaiah in God the Father. So in other words, everything that we have confidence in should be in God and what God provides. Now if that makes sense, say amen. amen. That's where it should be. And when we look in God's word right here, verse number one reminds us right out of the, the gate because let me just say this, God was about to take all of that away. God was about to take all of that away and we're a year removed from when it seemed like God shut down everything that had become idols. You want to worship Hollywood? He closed the theaters. You want to worship athletes? He closed the stadium. You want to worship all of these other things? He said none of that. Never did we dream some year and four months ago something like that could shut down this world as fast-paced and as busy as everything is that quick. But let me tell you, when God gets ready to shut her down, he can do it quick. <clears throat> and when we look in a very real sense here of what was going on, we need to see in verse number one that they had some supports, and you and I have some supports as well, but when we look in God's holy word, what we see right here is something that's very, very important. We see that there is a reminder how quickly things can change. In verse number one, he simply says this, the whole staff and the stay, he can be taken away. The whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. You say, well, I don't think that's possible. Uh, just as quickly as God made uh, uh, us all set at the house last year, uh, he can dry up the rain of heaven and we could have a famine on our hands quicker than we knew what to do with. I don't know about you, but I like to eat. Anybody else like to eat? Say amen. amen. Good. There's about to be some amens and some liars in the house right there. <clears throat> and, uh, by, you know, in the, in the Baptist world now, we know that to be true. We know that to be true uh, uh, because we have three ordinances in the Baptist church. You know what they are, right? You got them. Baptism, the Lord's Supper, and covered dish dinner. Amen. That's him. We all like to eat. And it says right here, he's telling Jerusalem and Judah, I can take away your stay and your staff, your support structures, everything that you're depending on. We're in a day and age when the world is trying to get us more and more dependent on everything except our Heavenly Father. Now, if that makes sense, say amen. amen. <coughs> Excuse me, little best learning. She didn't even ask. She just took off to get me water. I'm pretty sure that's where that run's going. So when we look right here in God's holy word, I want you to tell you this, this text could be, you came back way too quick, I'm wondering where that water came from, amen. <laughs> when we look in God's word, now I believe this text is a warning to the nations. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say it's a warning. Good, I hadn't planned to do that, but that gave me time to get a sip of water. So when we look at the, <clears throat> in God's word right here, it is a warning perhaps to us. And when we look in God's holy word right here in the book of Isaiah, he says in verse number one, the Lord 
the Lord of hosts. Now everybody understands this. Not everything that happens that you might consider bad is always at the hands of the devil. Sometimes it is the consequence of our own action. The Lord is going to have his will and his way, and he is worthy of that, by the way. Now, look with me, if you will, because I think it's important that we understand this, that it does not always do go well. By the way, it never goes well to make the Lord your enemy. Now, some of you may have an enemy, but if you make the Lord your enemy, I know who's going to win that battle. It does not do this church good to make the Lord our enemy. It does not do my, uh, my family, my household good to make the Lord our enemy. It will not do you good to make the Lord our enemy. Calvin, if you'll push me up just a little, it'll help me so I don't have to talk so much. Not as many words, just not as loud words. Amen. <clears throat> so when we look here in God's holy word, let me give you a scripture. Write it down. I'm going to give you four or five verses here, but I'm only going to put one on the screen. Ezekiel chapter number 16 and verse 47 through 50, but I want us to look at verse number 49. And in Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse number 49, here's what the Bible says. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in there and in her daughters. Listen, that sounds a lot like a land I... Call home. <clears throat> By the way, the biblical word for iniquity used in the New Testament when Jesus is talking about iniquity, it literally means lawlessness. Think about our society in the evening newscast. We are moving towards a society that is rejecting law and order. I believe that dude in the sandals we call Jesus knew what he was talking about. And everybody say it. And this verse here in Ezekiel says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread. The society was doing well. Abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. That sounds a whole lot like somewhere we are familiar with today. And here in Isaiah, we see the Lord is trying to tell them, at the end of chapter 2, don't put your trust in anything, your dependence on anything except God. And may I stand before you, if this is my last time to ever get to do that here in May of 2021, and tell you don't put your trust and your faith and your dependence on anything except the blood of Jesus Christ. When we look in this text right here, I want to give you three or four things as the Lord gives leadership today. First of all, they had an army. Somebody says, oh, we, we, we don't have to worry about anything. We got the best Military, well, hey, we're thankful. As a son of a Vietnam veteran, we're thankful for uh, men and women who have put their lives on the line to serve this country, and we're grateful. But let me tell you this, and the Bible is still right when it says the nation whose God is the Lord shall be blessed. And we want to have our ultimate dependence in what? God and his son Jesus. And we're grateful to have an army. But let me tell you this, God needs to be in charge. When we look here in verse number 2, the mighty man and the man of war. They've got all of these things. The mighty man and the man of war. They had supports there. They had an army. Go on in verse number 2. They also had public servants. It says that they had a judge and they had a prophet and they were prudent and the ancient. In other words, they had these people in positions in their society that things were going well. They were trusting in them. You don't think that's true today if we had a national disaster in our country today and we pray that we do not and we will pray for the people if we do have one that, that are impacted by that. But listen to this. When there is a natural disaster, your eyes should not be on Nashville. Your eyes should not be on Washington. Your eyes should be on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says from, I'm going to look to the hills from where cometh my help and strength. We need to understand that we are to be a people that are dependent on the Lord in all things. They had all of these people here. Jerusalem and Judah, quite frankly, thought, oh, nothing bad can happen to us. We got a great army. We got all these public servants. We got these judges. We got these prophets. We got these uh, prudent men. We got these, uh, 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 if you will, more senior members of our society that are wise and all of those kind of things. Number three, look in verse number four. They also had a government that was in place. He says, and I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. Why? Because if you go back and read verse number three, the captain of the 50 and the honorable man and the counselor and the cunning artificer and the eloquent, all of those things. Why, though, in verse number four does it begin to talk about these children? 
I don't know about you, but children don't always make the best decisions. If that's true, say amen. About six of you. Hey. <clears throat> Your children make great decisions? Good. Let them decide which bills to pay this month. Let them decide if you're going to go get a new car or you're going to have to keep driving the one you got because we can't really afford that extra payment. Your children, if your children make such good decisions, why didn't you let them make decisions when they were much younger? Children don't always make good decisions. And my dear friends, sometimes adults don't make decisions that are very much better. In verse number four, it says, I will give children to be their princes. Well, why is this? Because when you take the mighty man out of the equation in verse 2, and you take the men of valor and the men of reputation, in other words, when you take the people that should be leading out because they are not worthy of leading and they're not capable of leading, you're left with children to lead you. And then you wonder how you get in a bad spot. Sometimes I think we curiously get to a destination and wonder how we got there. When you take all of these people out and they're removed and God removes them in verse 2 and 3. Now you're still with me. Lee, boy, that about got me. I about just sideswiped that. That would have been a visual aid. <clears throat> when, you, when God removes all the people in verse 2 and 3, who's going to be left to lead? Children. I don't know about you, but children sometimes can be persuaded to not do the right thing. You don't believe that? I guarantee some of you adults have some pockets of candy that you're trying to persuade kids to be quiet during church so that now you may have a threat to go along with it, but you've probably got something. When children become the rulers, who are children going to have because they're not of age? They're going to have tutors. And they're going to have counselors. And they're going to have people in their ear that are trying to get them to make the wrong decisions because the decisions will ultimately benefit the people that are trying to get them to do that. Boy, that sounds a lot like lobbyists, doesn't it? Amen. And we get all these children in place. And may I say sometimes, now this is specifically here talking about literally children, young of age, and not of age, young people. And when we think about that in a real sense, that creates a great dilemma right here because uh, when they're uh, not of age, they don't have understanding, they don't have the appreciation, they don't understand the gravity of some of the decisions, and they are just swayed by whoever is tossing them to and fro and giving them the guidance. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse number 16, write it down so you can go back and read it this week. It begins by saying, Woe to thee when thy king is a child. And the princes eat in the morning. In verse number 5, this group of people in Jerusalem, Judea, we see that they had a union. They all were working together, right? It says, and the people shall be oppressed. Every one by another. Now this is true in our society today. We do not have the neighbor relationships, even in this room, among the people my age, that the people some of my senior in this room had with theirs growing up. And these young ch children and babies in there, and, and those things, as they grow up, they are not going to have that as well. We are oppressed, every one by another, in Jerusalem and Judah. It's what it's talking about. How do we do that? We injure each other. We hurt each other. Now listen, you say, well, I ain't hurt somebody. Sometimes it may be your thumbs on some of these social media sites hurting people. Boy, that's good, Shane. We needed to hear that. That's right. Amen. We have a group in our world that feels at liberty to put anything out there they want to. And it is a reflection of how far from God our society is. We injure each other. Well, they just needed to hear the truth. That's great. Who appointed you the one to tell them? What's it so quiet for, church? We hurt our neighbors in a world and in a building where we said we're going to come first and foremost and say love God and secondly say we're going to love each other. In Jerusalem and Judah, it's telling them here, you're an injurious people and you're unneighborly. And guess what? The kid rulers can't address that because we've removed and God has had to remove in verse 2 and 3 the others. Heavy message to a group of people that perhaps came to play church. 
and not ready to hear a heavy message. Every Sunday we come should be us opening God's holy word to hear from heaven. Not a pep talk. It's not a pregame speech telling you to go hit the floor and do everything. It's whatever God's got in store for us. In verse number 5, notice what it says. It says, and everyone by his neighbor. Most of us or a lot of us are fortunate enough to grew up, whether we're from here or not, where there's a place somewhere in the world we probably have great neighbors and we can think of them. But as we move in different things and as we continue to change the way we live, most of us or a lot of us or some of us or a few of us, whatever percent you want to put in there, struggle to be able to name some of our neighbors. Some of us probably don't have good relations with all our neighbors. Now, I understand there's some of those out there. That's why the Apostle Paul said, As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Paul had some neighbors like that too. But in verse 5, it tells us this, And the child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. Fortunately, our children in America and our children in the world are serving the Lord God and are not causing any trouble in society. I don't know about you, but my children cause trouble in the house, much less in society. Because we didn't have to teach our children to be disobedient. They figured it out all by themselves. Maybe your children were different. Your children like that, say amen. Oh, good. Everybody else, all the grandparents ain't going to say, no, my grandbabies are perfect. Children behave themselves proudly against the ancient and base against the honorable. Maybe y'all have not seen a newscast lately. God, thank you for giving me the message. I was apparently supposed to preach at a different church today. Insolent. Disorderly towards supervisors. If I've learned anything in leadership in the last 20 years, it's this. Everything's good until you tell somebody no. It's pretty peaceful at our house till I tell Allison, I, well, I mean, until she tells me no, amen. I got to get you to wake up here a little bit. It's good to tell somebody no, and sometimes Christians are like that even with God. God, I'll follow you until you tell me I can't have my way. We all want to be Burger King Christians. We can have it our way anytime. We need to think in a real sense what verse 5 is saying. To what it's saying to Jerusalem and Judah, I think also is saying to me and to you and to the churches today. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 32, I want you to look at that text and write it down. It says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head, in other words, the senior members, and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. It didn't say if they... If you want to, it didn't say, if you don't mind, it didn't say, try to squeeze that in. It says, thou shalt do that. And we as a society are in a day and age where we're murdering the unborn and we're doing as fast as we can to kill the ones that are too old to be productive citizens. We have lost our value for life on both ends of the spectrum. It didn't say, rise up if they're helping the economy. It didn't say, rise up if you like them. It said you shall rise up before those folks and you should do that in fear of God. And if you're not doing that for those people, it's because you don't fear God on the other hand. When we think about these things in verse number 6, we better leave verse number 5. Y'all liked it so well. They also had potential leaders. Jerusalem and Judah have all these things. They have an army. They have all these uh, public officials. They have, uh, if you will, all of these things in place. And now we get to verse 6, and they have these potential leaders. Notice what they said. When a man shall take hold of his brother, the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler. That goes exactly against the New Testament when we're told, Do not be respectful of persons because they dress nice. We're going to make them a ruler? Because they got good clothing? Maybe it's because they can shoot a good jump shot. Or toe to pig skin. Or cry at the drop of a hat and be a play actor. The prophet here is 
telling them the Lord, verse 1, verse 1, it says the Lord, the Lord of hosts, and then it goes down through his list, and then in verse 6, it says that we're going to grab somebody and says, hey, you're well-dressed, be our leader. And then we're going to wonder why we're in a mess. Sometimes it may not be in clothing in our world. Sometimes it may because they went to this fine, higher place of learning. They must be a good leader. Oh, maybe it's because their last name's so-and-so. Let me tell you this. We got enough biblical examples where daddy followed the Lord and sons didn't, and it didn't work out well. When a man shall take hold of his brother in the house, they're in a mess. They realize they're in a mess, and they're just going to say, hey, you still got a lot of good clothes. We're going to make you the ruler. Notice what the last part of verse 6 says. And then it says, and let this ruin be under thy hand. Oh, yeah, we want you to make sure you do that. Rulers should also be healers. Write that down. Everybody say healer. One, two, three. Yeah. Verse 7, though, says this. Verse 7 says that brother will come back and say, in that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer. Amen, we got some M leaders around, don't we? They'd rather divide us than unite us. They'd rather injure us than help us. Those are not true leaders that are servant leaders called of God. God is not an elephant. God is not a donkey. This is not a political statement. Those were not political phrases. It is talking about true leadership. is servant leadership, which wants to heal up the wounds of the people and be a healer and bring us together. Now, we're not talking about compromising. I'll be honest. I'd rather us to be divided over truth than be united in false doctrine. But what I am talking about is what verse 7 says. says, I won't be a healer. You know why? Because in my house... Is neither bread nor clothing either. Make me not a ruler of the people. Have you ever asked yourself about, and I'm not talking about local, I don't want you to think I'm talking about that. I'm not even talking about anybody in the national scene. But have you ever asked yourself or thought to yourself, boy, oh, so-and-so, oh, so-and-so ought to run for office. They'd be a good leader. And they go, oh, no, 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 not me. I don't want any part of that. Why? Because sometimes it seems so crooked and so perverted they don't want to get intertwined in that. Fortunately, this was just in Jerusalem and Judah. Devil, God made the water, and I'm going to use that water to allow me to say what God's given me to say today. You ain't going to close my throat. Why would God do this? I thought God was a God of love. Why would he do this? Why would he hurt Jerusalem and Judah? I mean, that's the holy city Jerusalem is. That's his people. Why would he do that? Look in verse 8 and it tells us. Isn't that funny how the Bible asks questions and answers them? I kind of like it. It's almost like he's had a design in mind. In verse 8 it says Jerusalem's ruined and Judah's fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. What about that? What a coincidence. By the way, how many of you have watched any type of game lately? I know some of you probably have different feelings about college or pro sports and different things because of some political stances they've all made. I'm just asking in general. I've noticed this lately. Sometimes the ref will say this, dead ball, personal foul. Or here's my favorite that makes me angry. Targeting, ready, against that team, 15 yards. And number 15 is what? Disqualified. I like it when the refs say this, though. Number 15 has disqualified himself. Because when 15 breaks the rules, he didn't get disqualified. He disqualified himself. You know, I, I didn't eat healthy yesterday. And you know what I did this morning? I didn't weigh. Because I disqualified myself yesterday from having any chance of being less today than I was yesterday morning. It ain't the scale's fault. 
It wasn't the Philly cheese steak I ate with fries last night. It wasn't the five pieces of bread that they brought us before they brought the Philly cheese steak. It wasn't the sandwich and the two fudge rounds at 1 o'clock. It was my fault. I stopped in the middle of the day. I didn't want you to know what I had before then. Amen. <laughs> but that ref will say, target him. 15 yards that way, and number 15 has disqualified himself. Isn't it funny? We still stand in the land and cry out for the Lord to bless us when I can't help but think our tongue and our doings are against the Lord. You say, well, they're not in my heart. Well, don't be so sure. We need to really spend some time in that. And preachers for the last 50 or 60 years have moved away or certainly in the last 30 or 40 have moved away from challenging people to pray and look within themselves and ask God to speak to them. And we've, if everybody, if, if the church is so healthy everywhere, church, then the nation wouldn't be going the direction it's going. And it's going. But begin at the house of God. In Jeremiah 25 and verse number 6, Here's what the Bible says. Let's just go by it. Go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them. And provoke me not to anger with the work of your hands. And I will do you no hurt. Hey, the prophet says, God has said, if you will do these things, I will do you no hurt. Now again, we always need to preface scripture with who's the audience, who's the speaker, and you know, the intended audience, and those kind of things. We have to be careful not to wrongly apply. But I do know this, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In this case, God is the one in Isaiah chapter 3 that's about to bring out a, a little bit of judgment. And in verse 8 of that chapter he says it's because of your words and your deeds but in Jeremiah it did tell us I'll do you no hurt and if you think about it in Jeremiah 25 verse 6 think about this too you say well we don't have any other gods in my house oh come on we got money we got greed I'd venture to say most all of us have our nose in the TV more than we have it in the word of God I'd venture to say that'd be called an idol. That'd be called another God. I'd venture to say that we all spend more time, we prioritize our whole day and then try to squeeze God into that a lot of days or some days or a few days or maybe all not. Again, this message clearly wasn't for here. It was for somewhere else. We're just trusting God uses YouTube today to get it to wherever it needs to go. Still with me? Say amen. We're said, don't go after other gods. By the way, how was Jerusalem in doing that? Well, specifically, if you go back and read some things and put it all together with their tongue, they were contradicting the word of the prophets. They didn't believe God and his prophet. You don't think that happens today? God sends a man of God to a church to pastor a church and not here, thank God, but other places. They'll eat him up and spit him out simply because he preaches the word of God. And they're more worried about having their programs and their little cliques and everything else that goes on in churches today than they are to hear truly from God. And I sincerely mean that. I appreciate the fact you all seemed uh, genuinely interested in hearing from the word of Almighty God. And their tongue says, oh, yeah, 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 oh, we want God, we want God, we want God. Sometimes you better really know what you're asking for. And their deeds followed their tongue. Why does God have an issue with them? You ever ask yourself, why does God, you ever ask somebody, why don't you like me? Now be careful, don't ask some people because they will tell you. Why don't you like me? Hey, by the way, may I say this, God loves Jerusalem. God loves Judah. So why on earth would he do this to him? I don't know about you, but if you are, did you remember disciplining your child? If you didn't, then you need to pray for forgiveness because the Bible said you should have been disciplining your child. Now, you shouldn't take too much joy in it, but I mean, you know. Why did you do that? God loves them. So why would he do this? Why would he take their mighty men? Why would he get rid of their army? Why would he get rid of their public service? Why would he get rid of all that? Why would he put children in to rule over them? Why would he allow all this to happen? Write it down. Sin. S-I-N. Church, you need to use that word a lot. Because we're in a day and age where the only sin is to tell somebody they're sinning. Or that they are a sinner. We have this 
we're just too smart. We're, we're just too educated. I had a mentor of mine that used to tell people, we're just educated beyond our intelligence sometimes. You still with me? Say amen. Let me, let me ask you a question. I, I, just a personal question. Just internalize this, pray about it, come back with it. If you don't owe me an answer, take it up with the Lord. But how, really, how serious do you take sin? I, I just wonder. If, if that word's okay, and this action's okay, well, my kids are old enough now, and this is okay, See, I think one of the reasons the lost people don't take sin too serious is I can't find really too many Christians that take it all that serious anymore. Now listen, I'm a sinner. I have to, I have to fight any vile imagination of things that you can think of. Anger, no comments. I mean... I just, I'm just human. But the fact that the preacher might battle some things doesn't make them not real things. And if I do them or you do them, they're still sin, and they must be taken serious. I used to get mad at ball games. I told Billy Ray, I said, I've gone home before. I don't know about you. Anybody, anybody, anybody ever got mad after a Tennessee ball game? Just raise your hand. Just be honest right here. I mean, I've driven home from Neyland Stadium, and I've preached every one of their funerals going home because I was so mad at what happened at that ball game. Isn't it funny? We'll get all tore up about that. And most all of us have space around us today if somebody not at church that we know needs Jesus. Or maybe somebody says they go to church here, but we just don't know it. Somebody asked me one time, how many people go to Bethel? I said about 600, but only 120 at a time. How serious do you take sin? Now here's the answer I want to give you to that question. God takes it very serious. So much so that he devised a plan to pay for our sin. And it involved his son dying. Souls are in danger in a group that tolerates sin. The Bible is the only book that has the remedy for sin. The only book. Now look, I know I, I said that about education. I'm not anti-education. Clearly in my line of work, I'm not about people being able to be educated. But I want to be educated in truth as well. But then we got all these people a few decades ago that got smarter than everybody, got smarter than the Bible. Behavioral psychologists and everything else. And again, we're blessed. We have some good Christian psychologists. We have some good Christian uh, 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 people that are in that line of work, but we also have some others that try to lead us down a horrible path. Here's this path. Man's not wicked. He's just weak. Oh, don't that sound so much better? So, so here's the difference. Whether he's wicked or weak, without Jesus, he's still going to go to hell. So I think it's better to tell him he's wicked so he has a chance to realize that and get in the Bible and find salvation. We're not we're not wicked. You're not allowed to say it anymore, preacher. That's too old-fashioned. We're just weak. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. We're not sinful. We're sick. Used to, we had all these sins. Now it's just a sickness. Is that not what we're told? Man's not evil. He's just ill. That's what we're being told. You know what it does? If I'm just sick instead of sinful, or if I'm just ill instead of evil, or if I am, am just a, a, a weak and not wicked, then I don't need the cure for my sin. And it keeps me away from biblical salvation. Boy, ain't the devil smart. Ain't he tricky. I know we ain't supposed to hate, but I hate the devil. I've asked for a front row seat when he gets thrown in the lake of fire. I don't know if the Lord will give it to me, but I've asked for it. I'm tired of fooling with him. You tired of fooling with the devil? Say amen. amen. By the way, if we have any wrong outlook on sin, we can never really have a 
the right outlook on salvation. Look in verse number 9. Look in verse number 9 of Isaiah 3. You still with me? Say amen. amen. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. I, I know that, that lots of us when we pray, even when we pray for America right now, here's how we pray sometimes. I know y'all don't do this. I'm just probably the only one. Lord, please help them come back to you and get them straightened out. Rarely does it start with, oh Lord, may I be where you want me to be. Maybe I'm the problem. By the way, why would we expect the lost world to be sold out to the Lord if we can't even get the church sold out to the Lord? And we just laughed about 600 and 125, but you all know as well as I do, there's some truth in that. So when we look in God's holy word right here in verse 9, their countenance doth witness against them. In Jeremiah chapter 2 in verse number 19, uh, the, uh, another verse that, that deals with uh, this says this, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that thy fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. Jerusalem and Judah, if you will, uh, where and reminds us of ourselves or where this is right here. In verse number 9, we don't have to look around and say, I wonder why all this is going on. Because our own countenance tells everybody. When we look in God's holy word in that first part of verse number 9, shame should be uh, what is, is having to be constrained but in rather than that, repentance is being driven away because our countenance is there. Notice what verse 9 says. And they declare their sin as Sodom. Now write this cycle down. I had that family come up with an extra word in it the other day, but write this down. All right, you still with me? Say amen. At the top of the circle is sometime in our past. We had a sense of right. Biblical right. R-I-G-H-T. Or at least that's how I spell it. Then we were told, tolerate. Then we were told, toler tolerating sin is not enough. You must accept it. Now we're being told, that's not enough. You must embrace it. That's the one the family helped me add. That's because I didn't know what that word meant they had to tell me. And what's next is, you're expected to promote it. That's the world we're in. Instead of calling sin, sin, we're expected to go from right to tolerate, to accept, to embrace, and then promote. And anything short of that makes you the bad guy. Now maybe when we leave here, I, I thought we all lived in different communities, but we're on the same planet. But if you're not in that world, then your spiritual antenna is either broke or we truly do leave here and drive home to different planets. That is the planet we're on right now. Now, if that makes sense, say amen. amen. Hey, by the way, notice what it says. They declare their sins such as where? Sodom. Everybody say Sodom. One, two, three. Sodom. Well, here's, let me give you three Bible verses real quick. Write them down. Genesis chapter 13 and verse 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Here we are. We're they, at least we knew what right and wrong was. But then in Genesis chapter 18 and verse 20, it goes, and over the course of time, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. Notice this, their sin got greater, but God's standard didn't change. And then in Genesis chapter 19 and verse number 5, and they called unto Lot and said unto him, where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Sin keeps getting bolder and God just keeps staying the same. But back in Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 9, everybody see how bad that was in Sodom? Genesis 13, Genesis 18, Genesis 19, it just was progressing and getting worse and worse and worse. And yet in Gen Isaiah chapter 3 and verse number 9, it says they de declare their sin as Sodom. Notice the next three words or four. They hide it not. Oh, Jerusalem and Judah. 
Unfortunately, that's not our world, is it? Notice the next phrase. Woe unto their soul. What sad state of Jerusalem and Judah. It says, woe unto them. They have allowed their society to go from God's chosen people and the holy city. They've allowed their spiritual condition to deteriorate. So not only are they in sin, but their whole countenance shows how bad they're in sin. It cries out like that of Sodom. They're not even trying to hide it. As a matter of fact, they're not hiding it. They're declaring it. They've moved from right to tolerance to acceptance to embracing it. And now they're promoting it. And the warning that I have for you today is the same one God was giving them. Woe unto their soul, except I think we need to say this, woe unto our souls. Notice the last part of the phrase. For they have rewarded evil unto themselves. As we close today, my question is, is, is this our community? Is this America today? Maybe this is us individually today. Do you struggle to just call sin, sin? Would you, does it make you feel better to call wickedness, weakness? Evil and illness and sinfulness a sickness? It's still a sin problem and the cure for sin is Jesus. Let me read you a few, few things right here real, real quick. Have we trusted in anything other than Christ? The old hymn says, Thou must save and thou alone. Brother Lee led us in the song today of Rock of Ages, one of the verses there, an additional verses that we didn't sing today, says, To thy cross I'll cling. In my hand, no price I bring, simply to thy cross I'll cling. These were people that were dependent on everything that sounds a lot like maybe our society, except the thing they needed to be dependent on. Do you rely on the military or physical strength? Are you relying on political leaders? Are you relying on the government? Do you think you have a good relationship with your neighbor? By the way, those of you that think, yeah, I get along with all my neighbors, just remind yourself that the next time you see somebody broke down on the interstate and you say, I don't know that I need to stop and help. Or maybe the next time you're broke down and you say, oh, is that person stopping to kill me or help me? See, in your heart, you know that we're not where we used to be as far as neighborly love. If that makes sense, say Amen. In your heart, you know that. I know it's been too long-winded, but God's going to just be in charge of that. Do we doubt God's word? Do we live by God's word? Are our tongues and our deeds pointing people to Jesus? Or are we like Jerusalem and Judah? Look in verse 10 as we quit today. Maybe verse 11 too. I may just go all the way to Isaiah 60. I'm just kidding. Say to the righteous, you're here today and you're born again and in the perfect will of God. Listen, I've preached a long time. I know this. Not everybody sitting in a pew is where they need to be a Jesus. On any Sunday. But if you're where you need to be a Jesus in all aspects of your life and you're saved, thank God for that. And thank you for doing that. And be of influence in my life. I need you to pour into me. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him. It will be well with you. The Bible says in the New Testament that your labor in the Lord shall not be in vain. And I know the Bible's accurate and right and without error. And to the righteous today, way to go. Keep up the good work and God will bless you for that. But verse 11 goes on and says this. But woe to the wicked. Let me put the SJV on this. It ain't going to work out well. So today, you know when we have earthquakes? We have earthquakes in our life, and we have earthquakes in the, the world when the fault lines finally start moving around and create a problem. You say, oh, I've got that little fault line in my life, but nobody knows about it. Eventually, it'll cause an earthquake. The fault lines will one day be revealed. But Jesus desires to heal your fault lines through the blood of the Lamb. And all of God's children say it. I want you to stand to your feet and bow your heads in a word of prayer.